In this video, we'll be showing you how to set up a project and walk through the steps of the tutorial in a simpler way. Um, the tutorial posted on the class website is still due. So the first step, whenever you open up Cordis for the first time, uh, keep in mind that everything you do in this program needs to be in a project. You have the option to make files directly, uh, but if you do this, it won't actually be able to do anything useful. So don't do that. <laughs> make sure you create a project. So it has a new project wizard that I just always use. So if you click that, it'll bring you through a step-by-step -step, uh, way to produce a project. Uh, so this is the introduction. We'll just hit next. So the first thing that you want to do is actually uh, set the directory, the name, and the create a file for it to actually base the project around. So I don't recommend using the uh, base directory that it provides. I would recommend having a folder on your desktop or somewhere to actually uh, put your projects in. So I'm just going to call this test. Um, it's a bad name, but it works. So I'll select that folder. I'm going to call this Cordis Video. Normally for your labs, this would be something like Lab 1A, Lab 2C. Um, that's normally the syntax that we use. You'll find the names for your labs and the parts of your labs in the lab document. So make sure to read it thoroughly. So after we do this step, we'll hit next. It'll ask if we want to make an empty project or project uh, from a template. We're just going to make an empty project. Sometimes you might need to add source files that we provide to you, and you can do that through navigating and finding them here. Uh, however, with this one, we're just going to be starting from scratch, so that won't be necessary. The next step is to actually select the type of board that we're going to be using. So our board has a specific serial number, uh, which is posted in the lab uh, documents as well as in the actual lab uh, room itself. So our board is a max five board. And the way that we can find it is just by typing it here in the name filter. So it is 5M570ZT100C5. So if you type it in there, it'll be the only one that's left at the bottom. So you want to click that to select it and then hit next. This is asking for different tool settings. Uh, you can leave this as a default. And finally, it'll produce a summary. So if we did all those steps correctly, we can hit finish and it will actually create the project. So once the project is finished being made, you can see uh, here on the left that we have now our board uh, is listed here as well as the name of the project. So the first step that you want to do for any project is create uh, what's called a block design file. You can do that by clicking this new file icon in the top left corner. Um, actually, block diagram. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to hit OK. You just select it from there, that list, and hit OK, and we'll be presented with this grid. So this is where we're going to be doing all of our actual designs this semester. It will be in a file much like this one. So there's several things that uh, we want you to be able to do uh, after d taking this tutorial. So the first is we, you have to label your designs with things like your name, your TA's name, and a description of the actual part itself. So there's a text tool up on this toolbar. It's an A. If you click somewhere in the BDF and start typing, you can see how uh, you can add text to the screen and there there's sometimes an issue where the text can be cut off this is due to the ratio of your screen um, we can go over how to fix this in the first lab yeah normally you can add spaces to the end and it will expand the size that gets displayed and for some laptops you might have to change the resolution of your computer this is um, very common for Surface laptops in particular. So that is how to place text and the lab rules and policies specify exactly what you need to have um, for each lab submission. So the other thing that you have to be able to do is place the actual symbols and gates and different parts in the design itself. So up here at the top there's a picture of an AND gate if you click that, you'll be brought up with this interface, and you can search for the different uh, types of gates that you may want to add. So, for instance, 
if you type in AND2, it'll search the entire database and find the implementation of an AND gate. There's a function here called repeat insert mode, so if you have this selected, it will constantly let you put in AND gates until you hit escape. So I'm going to turn that off because I just want to place one. A note about the names, they are often indicative of uh, what the symbol looks like. So obviously an, something that has AND in the name is an AND gate. There's also NOT, NAND, OR, so on and so forth. And usually there is a number after that name, and that number indicates how many inputs it has. So in this uh, screen, you can see we have AND2, AND3, AND4, and of course those are a 2 input, 3 input, and 4 input AND gate. So I'm going to place the AND2 in the BDF. And I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see it better. So once you uh, just click it in there, it'll be placed there. I'm also going to take this time to add a NOT gate uh, at the output of the AND. So if you just type in NOT, it'll show up. You can see the part here to verify and then hit OK. So I'm going to put the NOT below the AND gate here. So say these are the two gates that we want to implement for our design. So what the goal is, is I want to have an input come into the AND, an input come into this other gate uh, input for the AND, and then this output get passed through the NOT gate, and then that will be the output of our entire circuit. So whenever you're using Cordis, you have to define what your inputs and outputs actually are. And the way that we can let the program know that is by using uh, an input pin or output pin. So up here at the top, you have what's called the pin tool. If you hit this drop down menu, you can select input or output. So say I have an input here. I would need two inputs, one for each input to the gate, and we can select an output as well. You can also find these inputs and output pins in the symbol screen. So we have our two inputs and our one output. However, right now they're just defaulted to be called pin name, uh, pin name one, etc. So say I want to have one input called A and I want to have another input called B low. So one thing to keep in mind about Cordis is once you've learned about activation levels, it doesn't actually mean anything to Cordis. However, for the purpose of whenever we're designing our circuits, we like to at least uh, provide them with meaningful names for the inputs and outputs so that way whenever we're looking at this we actually know what the activation level is intended to be so this underscore L does not do anything functionally it's just a way for us to indicate uh, how we're implementing it so say we have A and then BL again this is a, just a display issue it's a result of my laptop and our output can be called X low just we're making a random circuit right now. <laughs> a way that you can connect inputs and outputs and different intermediate steps of a circuit together are using wires. So this tool up here will allow you to draw wires on the screen. So the way that you can connect them is just by clicking where you want to start and dragging to where you want to connect it to. So see how we made this blue line appear? And if we click elsewhere, it will not deselect. Yeah. So if we drag from here to here, the, we have to be careful because if we see where it's drawing the wire, it's going to connect to the top input as well. So we might want to do this one in two steps. So just be careful whenever you're drawing wires that you uh, don't accidentally let them overlap. Uh, and so once we have wires drawn, we can you know, edit it, change its shape, and so on. So we have these two inputs connected to the AND gate and the AND gate is going to have some output. Another way that you can connect uh, parts of this diagram together are through labels. So say I label this A out. What I want is for this A out to get connected to the input of the NOT gate. So if I pull out a wire here and I type just while the wire selected A out, 
What Quartus does is it recognizes that these two labels are the same and will automatically connect them together whenever you compile your project. This is important for when we get into larger and more complicated labs. Instead of having wires that are all over the place and crossing each other, you can just use labels to uh, navigate through your schematic. So for this BDF, the last thing that we want to do is connect the output of this knot to x low. So again, using labels, I'm just going to type x underscore l, which is the same name as this output pin. And so in doing that, Cordis will recognize this output needs to be connected to this output, and it will automatically route them together whenever we compile. So now this is a completed BDF. We have our text, we have our name, we have the different connections required. Um, so the next step that we want to take after this is doing simulation. So in order to simulate, uh, first we have to compile this project. So there are two main ways that we're going to be compiling throughout the semester. We have what's called a full compile uh, and a analysis and synthesis compilation. So if you look up here at the top, you have uh, three different buttons. This uh, triangle without like a check mark next to it is for a full compile. And the second one over is for analysis and synthesis. Also, if you look down here at the bottom left, you have these different uh, compilation steps. You can also click here to do each respective step. So I'm going to start with the analysis, analysis and synthesis. So if we click this, it'll ask for us to save our changes. I'm just going to say yes. And so it'll start doing the compilation. And if you look here at the bottom left, it's just, it has this percentage next to analysis, analysis and synthesis. So that's the step that it's doing. So it might take a little bit of time for it to finish, uh, but you can see the percentage step up as it uh, continues. So once the analysis and synthesis completes, you'll be able to see that it produces a check mark here, which means it succeeded. If it produces any errors, such as if you have things connected incorrectly or uh, labels incorrectly named, it'll produce errors in this menu down here. And you should be able to double click those errors to find actually where in your design it's referencing. If you're unsure of how to deal with an error, a lot of them will have an error number as listed next to the message. Um, oftentimes you can Google this error number to find solutions. And if that doesn't work, you can always come into office hours and ask a PI for help. So we have our BDF compiled now, which means that the program has actually implemented this design on the board. Uh, so now we want to actually be able to simulate it. So when we do that, we're going to go to the new file menu again and scroll down to find University Program BWF. And I'll hit OK. So this will produce a second window, which will actually allow us to produce a simulation. So the first thing that we have to do is, if you notice here, we don't have any inputs or outputs labeled. So if we go to Edit, Insert, Insert Node or Bus, and then click Node Finder, and list. This will list all of our, they're called nodes, they're the inputs and outputs for our circuit. Clicking this double to the right arrow will move them to our selected list. All of the nodes that you see in this list correspond to the pins that we put as inputs and outputs. This does not correspond to every single node on a gate. So you'll notice that one of our signals A out is not on this list because that is known as an internal signal, not an input or an output. So once we have this uh, then put in our selected list, if we hit OK and then OK, they will appear here now. So it's at this point that we can start to actually modify uh, the waveform of the input and try to see what the output becomes. One way that we can do this is just manually by selecting regions on the screen and using these buttons up here. So one will make it go high, zero will make it go low. So what we could do is do this for the entire length of the simulation that we want to use and manually make the uh, inputs what we want. Another thing that we can do, and you'll find this uh, very useful particularly for lab one, 
is to select both of these and we want to put them in a group. So if you select both of them with control, you can select grouping and group. I'm going to call the group inputs and then hit OK. This will collapse them together and make them behave as like one binary number. And then if you select a group, you can hit this button here, which is called count value. And this will let it automatically count uh, from zero up until its maximum possible number. So if you see here, it says radix, binary. We're going to start at zero and increment by one every time uh, in a binary order. And it'll say how often we want to count. So say I put in 25 nanoseconds. What it will do is automatically make these numbers go through their specified order. So you see it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. And it will do this for the entire length of the simulation. So now we have our input set up and we want to see what our outputs become. So in order to do that, we're going to use up here, we have uh, buttons called run functional simulation and run timing simulation. You can also access these through the simulation menu up at the top. So I'm going to run functional simulation right now. It's asking me to save the file, so I'm just going to say yes. Oftentimes, Cordis can run into errors if you're simulating with a file that is not named waveform. So we recommend that you save it as waveform or waveform one. And if you have to run multiple simulations, you should run them one at a time, take your screenshots, and then save over the file. So once the simulation finishes, it'll bring it'll open a new window which has the calculated output. So if I zoom in here, you'll see that now X low instead of being undefined as before is actually filled in with values. And we can see now that an input of 0, 0 corresponds to high, 0, 1 corresponds to high, and so on. So this is just a useful way to be able to test our circuits, especially combinatorial logic circuits, um, where you have a truth table and voltage table to compare uh, against. So this was a functional simulation. So the other type of simulation that you can do is a timing simulation. So in order to do a timing simulation, uh, you have to do a full compile because a full compile will actually do all the analysis required to put the circuit on our board and calculate the different timing impacts that the circuitry itself can have. So I'm going to close this simulation for now and run the full compile. So once the full compile finishes, uh, we can verify that by looking again here at the bottom left and you'll see that now we have five green check marks, which means we did the entire compile. So if I go back to the VWF, which you have to open it through uh, this menu again. So we're here, and then I can hit open, select our waveform, and it will load it in. Now that we've done a full compile, I can hit uh, run timing simulation, and it will produce a timing simulation for our circuit. So if we look here, it, the output looks pretty similar to what we had before, but if you notice here at the beginning, we have this brief period of an undetermined output, uh, which comes as a result of the timing. So this makes it a little bit harder to actually read because, for instance, this 1-1 one, one period of inputs here corresponds to this low period of output here. So they don't actually line up exactly, and this is just a result of the actual implementation on the board. Um, however, we will ask you to do some timing simulations throughout the semester, so you should know how to do it. So that's pretty much it for what we wanted to show you uh, on how to do in Cordis. That'll, this is a good way to get you started on Lab 1 uh, whenever you're, you're actually doing these mixed logic circuits. So uh, as always, if you have any questions about how to use the software or about the lab, uh, feel free to contact any PI and we will be more than happy to help you in office hours or via email.